All right, so introduction. A lot of the chapters in this module are chapters that you may have covered in your EMT course. Um, while covering these chapters in your advance, you need to pay close attention to these chapters. They are the chapters that we would consider to be boring, but it's very important that you pay attention to how an EMS system is structured, for it is broken down in terms of BLS and ALS procedures and what your role will be as an AEMT and how you will integrate into your team. So that's going to be important. Also, the, the importance of protocols, continuing medical education, um, proper regulation, all of that is covered in this module. We will also be covering medical terminology, human body, and pathophysiology in um, this chapter. And I think the last chapter is lifespan development. No, we're definitely not going to cover all of that today, but over the next couple of days for sure. So let's get started with this chapter, chapter one. EMS systems. Let me shift this. All right. Let us go forward. So the National EMS Education Standard Competences for this chapter, preparation or preparatory, applies fundamental knowledge of the EMS system, the safety well-being of the AEMT, and medical and legal and ethical issues to the provision of emergency care. We'll be looking at EMS systems, the history of EMS, the history of EMS, role and responsibilities, professionalism of EMS personnel, quality improvement, patient safety. The chapter also look at the role of research and how that will impact EMS here in the field. And of course, the role of public health, which all of us are very familiar with at this point, having experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. Public health is very important. All right, introduction. EMS is a system, so it's an organized system that is set up to field um, emergency calls, whether it's trauma or medical. And through a dispatch system, the dispatcher gather information and determine what is the most appropriate emergency response. And that can be fire, it can be police, it can be BLS, or it can be ALS. This chapter describes that system key components, how they influence and affect AEMTs, the administration of medical direction, quality control, and regulation of EMS services. And of course, we'll be looking at the roles and responsibilities of AEMTs. Course description. Course description. So we're still on the course description. Emergency medical services. I kind of already explained this earlier. A team of healthcare professionals provides pre hospital and hospital emergency care and transport of the sick and injured. 
as part of a local or regional EMS system. And in Jamaica, it is a part of the, it, it can be government based or private. So it's a part of the fire brigade, it's a part of the JDF, and you have private entities. And you also have industrial um, entities that have EMS response, and we have EMS tied to the hospitals in Jamaica, some hospitals, not all. It is governed by state laws and typically regulated by a state EMS office. People who provide medical care must be state licensed or certified. So if you're going to work in an EMS system, you cannot work without a license or a certification that is up to date. Let me just backtrack a bit. All right. Now, for training and licensure levels, that fall under the Department of Transportation. Now, there are levels outside of this. Um, They're just not a part of the DOT. And depending on where you work in the world, you, you might come across different levels. So, but standard, you have EMR, EMT, AEMT, and paramedics. EMRs are the first medically trained professional to arrive on the scene and provide initial care and assistance. A EMR primarily functions outside the ambulance. So these are firefighters, police officers, park rangers. They are the first to come in um, contact with the patient. Their role is primarily outside of the ambulance but they can provide assistance when an ambulance arrives. And if an AEMT requires assistance on the unit, they can request an EMR. But the EMR should not have um, direct responsibility for the patient on an ambulance. So that's the EMRs. Then you have the EMTs who have basic training in basic life support, which include automated external defibrillation, the use of earway adjuncts, assistance with certain medications. Then you have the AEMTs. The AEMTs have advanced training in specific aspects of advanced life support, which includes intravenous IV therapy. So it can be intra venous IV or intraosseous. AEMTs can do intraosseous as well. They can administer certain medications and they can use certain advanced earway adjuncts. And depending on where you work, they can also do, some of them can do dynamic and static cardiology or cardiac monitoring. Then you have the paramedics. The paramedics have um, extensive ALS training and it includes, but it's not limited to endotracheal intubation, emergency pharmacology, cardiac monitoring, which includes static and dynamic um, cardiology. And they can provide other advanced, they can provide advanced assessment and treatment. Training and licensure requirement will vary by state. This textbook covers the 2009 National EMS Education Standards. The NHTSA is a federal administrative source for curriculum and related documents. So that's the NH. TSA is the government arm that is responsible for the development of curriculum, curriculums that are used in EMS education, National Highway Traffic and Safety Act. 
I believe. Double check that. <laughs> now, AMT training, focus and requirements. AEMTs provide emergency care to the sick and injured. Some patients are in life-threatening situation. Others require only supportive care. So the truth is, well, it depends on where you work, right? So, but um, you'll do routine transport. You'll be required to provide life-saving um, procedures, even administer medication. Based on, based on the nature of the call. And let me just backtrack for a bit. The requirements to become a AEMT in Jamaica, you're required to be a current EMT. Your BLS should be up to date and you should have a base knowledge of 70, preferably 75% for your EMT level. Still on AEMT training, focus and requirements. Some of the subjects discussed or that will be covered in this course will include scene size of patient assessment, treatment, packaging, and um, focusing on EMS as a career. Licensure requirements, and this will differ state to state. Some state has licensure um, requirements, some have state certification. So general requirements to be an AEMTR, high school diploma or equivalent, proof of immunization against certain communicable disease, valid driver's license. Um, Candidates are required to successfully complete a background check, check drug screening, BLS CPR course. Um, a state, they must complete a state recognized AEMT course. They must complete a state recognized written certification exam and a state recognized practical certification exam. They must be able to demonstrate the ability to meet psychological and physical criteria to perform the job. So you have to be physically fit, mentally, and mentally prepared to deal with the job. Compliance with other state, local, and employer provisions. So they must be compliant. And it will, def um, some states might add a little more, some states might take out some, and some employers might have other requirements. State recognized written and practical exam may be the NREMT exam based on the individual, or it may, it may be the NREMT exam, sorry, or it might be a state exam. Um, in Jamaica, we don't have a registration exam, so the, the options for registration is gonna be CAFC, Caribbean Association of Fire Chief Registration for EMS, Global Registry, or the NREMT Registration Exam. Now, I always tell my students that if they're going to attempt the NREMT exam, and there's a way to transition from your international certification to a national registry exam. So if you're interested in that, we can have a discussion about that of the, the year. But I always tell students, if they are going to attempt the, the national registry exam, that exam is if you intend to migrate. So if you plan to migrate and work somewhere else in the world, specifically the US, then it's going to be necessary for you to have the national registry. If you're not going to migrate, then you don't, it's going to be difficult if you're in Jamaica to maintain the national registry. So that's something to think about. But if you're thinking about migrating to the US or 
going into a paramedic program in the U.S., then you'll definitely need the National Registry ex um, certification. And there is a process. So there is a way to transition to that. Right? Now, the, it requires recertification every two years. Please, please note the two years. Please note the two years. Recertification every two years. Most states recognize NREMT certification and it can, they, it can provide reciprocity. States may exclude certain people from AEMT certification. Americans with Disability Act, ADA, protects people with disabilities from being denied access to programs and services provided by state and local governments, prohibits employers from failing to provide full and equal employment to the disabled, protects those with disabilities seeking gainful employment under many circumstances. Now let's look at the history of EMS. Origins of EMS started with the volunteers in World War I. So they had volunteer ambulances in World War I. In World War II, it evolved to specially trained field care providers. And in the Korean conflict, it evolved into the medic, field medic, rapid um, evacuation via helicopter to a mobile surgical hospital. So it, most of the, the skills or equipments that we use today in EMS, they were first used in the, the military. And um, <clears throat> once, once they are tested, well, I don't want to say tested, but they were first used in military conflict. And if they are deemed to be effective, eventually transition into the civilian EMS system. As late as the 1970s, emergency ambulance services and care vary widely in the United States. Modern EMS originated in 1966 with the publication of the Accidental Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease of Modern Society, also known as the White Paper. So, this document, research document, um, highlighted a, a lot of um, inefficiencies in how EMS was operating in the states and what was the, the result of these inefficiencies. And as a result, the government, the federal government had to step in and regulate it properly. And that's how the DOT, Department of Transportation, was established, which is responsible for publishing the EMT training curriculum. The AAOS prepared the first EMT textbook in 1971. I think it's the American Association of Orthopedic Surgeons. This textbook is the AEMT level of that book. So the book that you'll be using for that this course is the AEMT level of that book that was published in 1971. Through the 1970s, EMS developed. So it continued to develop from there. The availability of ALS level care grew. Roles and responsibilities of EMS prov providers began to vary. So they start to specialize or differentiate. We have EMRs, EMTs, AEMTs, paramedics, 
and their scope of practice and their standard of care was clearly um, defined. Efforts are underway to standardize levels of EMS education nationally. And that is important. So if you, the field practice is standardized, the education should be standardized. It should be that if you go to a, a, another institution, they are teaching something different than what FEMS is teaching. It should be standardized across the board. Now, levels of training. Licensure is a state function at the federal level. They are responsible for national EMS scope of practice model, and it provides the minimum skills for EMS at each level. So that's done at a federal level. At the state level, this is where laws are passed to regulate EMS provider operations. And at the local level, you have the medical director who is responsible for day-to-day -day, um, limits. Public BLS and immediate aid. Millions of lay people are trained in BLS slash CPR. Many have taken basic first aid courses. So this is definitely a plus to have the, the public or lay people trained as, as first aiders or BLS, trained to provide BLS or CPR. But um, I, I do believe in Jamaica, they need to have um, campaigns or ads that run probably every three months or every month to, to highlight certain first aid procedures that can be done in case there is an emergency, especially um, bleeding control. So designed to provide necessary critical care before responders can arrive. That's the purpose of most first aid courses. Persons who can be taught first aid, teachers, coaches, babysitter, babysitters, etc. Anybody. People who regularly accompany groups on trips. Mm -hmm. So persons who accompany pers regularly accompany persons on trip should have some type of first aid training because persons on this trip can get injured, can get sick. So that would be important. That would be important. Automated external defibrillators, AEDs, detect treatable life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias and deliver appropriate electrical shock designed to be used by untrained lay people. Include in every pre-hospital emergency. Sorry, included in every pre-hospital emergency training. So this is a must. You must know how to use an automated external defibrillator. You should also be familiar with how to use a cardiac monitor as well. And we will definitely be covering that for this course. Emergency medical responders. In EMS, in EMS, because the presence of trained persons on scene cannot be ensured, EMRs are, are important. So EMRs include law enforcement officers, firefighters, park rangers, ski patrollers. These are the first persons to make contact with the patient and they can provide life-sustaining care until EMS response is available. And when EMS response is available, they can assist. They are trained to initiate immediate care and assist other EMS personnel on their arrival. Good Samaritans are trained in, trained in first aid and CPR often show up at a scene. 
They can provide valuable assistance. They can also interfere with operations and endanger themselves and others. So these good Samaritans can be, uh, as, uh, they can provide assistance that is useful if they have um, good training and they're able to execute this training effectively, or they can be uh, an issue. They can interfere with how you need to operate and do what is necessary for the patient because they, they, whatever they're doing is not correct or may be harmful. I then, so you need to pay attention so if there are good Samaritans present, make sure you're observing um, how they, they interact with the scene and the patient, whether or not you can use their assistance or whether or not you need to um, establish some type of crowd control to get them away from the patient. Emergency medical technicians. The EMT course requires about 150 hours, more in some states, provides essential knowledge and skills to provide basic emergency care. On arrival at scene, AEMTs and other providers assume responsibility for assessment, care, packaging, and transport of patient to the ED. Advanced Emergency Medical Technician. AEMT course and training provide knowledge and skills in specific aspects of ALS. AEMT course range is approximately 200 to 400 hours. You're going to get somewhere between three, 300, over 300 hours, or it might work out to 480. Paramedics. Extensive course of training requires 1,000 to 1,300, can be more than 1,300 hours, may be offered within the context of an associate or bachelor degree program. So a paramedic course can be completed in one year, can be completed in two, can be completed in three years, it can be completed in four. Most paramedics who um, acquire an associate degree or a Bachelor of Science usually acquire that degree to branch into another area of medicine or to um, elevate themselves into the role of an educator or EMS director. The paramedic has have paramedics have a wide range of ALS skills. Components of an EMS system. EMS agenda for the future is a multidisciplinary national review outlining all aspects of EMS delivery. The intent is to develop a more cohesive and consistent system across the United States. Keyword consistent. 14 EMS attributes are described, which are the guiding principles for continued evolution of EMS. In 1999, the NHTSA and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, Health Resource, Resources Services Administration, developed the EMS Agenda for the Future, which is an implementation guide. It had 10 objectives aimed at achieving all components outlined in the EMS agenda for the future. Now let's look at what are some key components to a strong and properly developed EMS system, public access. So the public must have access to the system. So it must be easy to access when, a, when they need help during an emergency. 
911 system is usually the public safety access point. And within this system, you have trained dispatchers who obtain information and dispatch the most relevant response. You have enhanced 911 systems, which provide additional data like address and phone number of the caller. Training the public on how to summon an EMS unit is an important part of public education responsibility. So once there is a public access system available, the public needs to know how to access the system. EMD systems assist dispatchers in giving callers vital instructions until EMS arrival, and this is important. So an emergency medical dispatch system is important because they are able to give the caller details or give the, the caller instructions on what they can do to assist the patient until EMS is available. Reality of call may differ from dispatch description. It happens at times. The dispatchers can relay only the information provided to them by the caller. So do not develop tunnel vision. Uh, EMS system must have a good communication system. From caller information, dispatcher selects parts of emergency system to activate. According to the National Fire Protection Association, 46% of fire departments provide BLS care, 16% of fire departments provide ALS care, and 39% of fire departments do not provide emergency medical services. So the majority of the emergencies that the fire department is getting is emergency, is medical emergencies and not necessarily fire emergencies. That's important to note. EMS may be a part of a fire department. It might be a part of a police department or it may be independent. New technology helps responders locate their patients, their current on local resources. EMS system, within an EMS system, good clinical care must be provided to the patient. You will use a wide range of equipments to do this, and you must be familiar with the equipment. Check equipment before going on duty to ensure it is in the assigned place, it is working properly. You are familiar with the specific model. You may be called on to drive the ambulance, become familiar with roads in your primary service area or sector. Before you go on duty, check equipment and supplies, communication equipment, vehicle key, fluids, condition of tires, driver's control, built-in units and controls in patient compartment. Do your checks. Uh, EMS system must have human resources deals with people within the EMS system. So that's what human resources speak to. Concept is to provide an environment where talented people want to work and can turn their passion into a rewarding career. So we don't want to be working in a system that demotivates us as EMS responders, because if we're demotivated, we won't be able to provide the appropriate level of care for our patients. Efforts are being made to ensure EMS providers can relocate from one state to another more easily. One of the functions of the national EMS scope of practice model is to create stable foundations on which each level of EMS provider is grounded. The EMS agenda for the future encourages the creation of systems that help protect the well being of EMS providers. And of course, 
uh, EMS system must have medical direction and medical control. Physician medical director authorizes providers to give medical care in the field. Appropriate care is described in standing orders and protocols. That's your offline medical direction. But you can also speak directly to your medical director to get advice or instructions. That's online medical direction. So the medical director is a working liaison among medical community, hospitals, and AEMTs. So the medical director is a very important link in order for things to flow seamlessly. Medical control can be offline or online, online direct. Physician directions given over the phone or radio can be communicated by designee. Offline indirect, standing orders, training, supervision. Legislation and regulation. Cannot have an EMS system that doesn't have laws or is not regulated. So training, protocols, practice, follow state legislation, rules, regulations, and guidelines. Medical directors, along with EMS supervisor, supervisors and others, develop protocols for service areas. EMS is usually administered by a senior EMS official. Daily operation and direction of service are provided by an, an appointed chief executive officer. Integration of health services. Pre-hospital care is coordinated with care administered at the hospital. So pre-hospital and in-hospital in care work together. They are linked. They support each other. Some EMS systems have collaborated with local hospitals to improve patient outcomes associated with time-sensitive treatment for heart attacks, trauma, stroke. Mobile integrated healthcare. This is a new system of delivering healthcare that utilizes the pre hospital spectrum. Evolved as a result of patient protection and affordability, affordable care act. This model offers access to care to patients who live in communities with limited medical resources. A EMS system must be evaluated to determine if it is effective or to determine if any component needs to be restructured or modified. Medical director maintains quality control, reviews patient care reports with other staff, um, continuous quality improvement, also known as um, QA, reviews and audits all aspects of an EMS caller. For some reason, I can't remember what QA means. Just double check that. I think it's quality assurance. Review meetings are held and feedback giving. Refresher training and continuing education is important. If there is no refresher training or no continuing education, then EMS providers will develop skill decay. And we don't want that happening if we're going out there to interact with patients. Times when error can occur. So error can occur. Communicating with other AEMTs or transferring the patient to the ED. Driving to the scene can be hazardous. Patient can be dropped during lifting and moving. Eliminate errors as much as possible. The environment can also contribute to errors. So try and avoid making errors. They can happen. The most important thing is that when an error occurs, 
learn from it. And our goal is that the error to reduce the chance of errors occurring that can be life threatening. That's what we don't want, but there will be errors. Ask why I am doing this. Use cheat, cheat sheets to limit errors. So use your cheat sheets. Use downtime to ref refresh skills used less often. And all this is saying is you need to be consistent, right? You need to remember why it is that you made a decision to become an AEMT. You need to have your protocols or your cheat sheets. You need to have access to your medical director that if you come across something that um, is outside the box, you can get advice. You need to refresh your skills, especially the ones that you're not using. And this must be consistent. In order to be effective as a responder, you need to be consistent. Information systems. Information system allow EMS providers to efficiently document the emergency medical care that has been delivered. Information is used for a variety of purposes. Can be used to construct educational sessions for the department. Can use to collect data from ambulance activity logs. And this data can be used to justify whether additional personnel should be hired. System finance. Funding system allows EMS departments to continue to provide care. Several types of EMS departments exist in the United States. Journal of Emergency Medical Services reports annually on how EMS is delivered within the United States. And I don't think EMS is getting the, the funding it needs in the, the United States. I don't think it is um, getting sufficient funding because they're having a shortage right now in um, EMS responders. So persons are leaving the job because it, it doesn't pay that well at, at certain levels in the United States. So outside of the fire department, EMS doesn't really pay that well. And it's because it's poorly funded in the United States. Financial resources are available for EMS departments through taxation, fee for service, paid subscription, donations, federal, state, local grants, fundraisers, combinations of above. Now, the education system, the instructors for AEMT courses are approved and licensed by the state EMS office or agency. And any instructor that is going to um, teach AEMT courses must be above that level. And they are all, some are also required to have a Bachelor of Science degree or higher. Most EMS training programs must adhere to the national standards established by the CO, the Committee on Accreditation of Educational Programs for EMS Medical Services Professional. This is the um, body that regulates EMS education. Um, the other one is the Commission on Accreditation of Allied Health Education Programs. A, ALS level instructors and directors must hold a four-year degree or higher. I mentioned this previously. So any instructor that is going to be teaching ALS programs need to have a degree, whether that's a 
Bachelor of Science or higher. As an AEMT, you are required to attend a certain number of hours of continuing education approved for AEMTs each year, each year, not every two years, each year to maintain and update and expand your knowledge and skill. Prevention and public education. Public health examines the health needs of the entire population with the goal of preventing health problems. EMS works with public health agencies on two strategies, primary prevention, secondary prevention. EMS research. Ongoing research provides a scientific basis for standards. So research is necessary in order for EMS to evolve. And EMS is moving towards evidence-based practice. And the research will, will support or strengthen the standard of care. So we use research to determine what the standard of care should be. EMS research may be performed by EMS providers or other people who are studying a particular branch of medicine. Can also be done at each EMS facility. Important for EMS providers to stay up to date on the latest advances in medicine. Transport to specialty centers. Some centers focus on specific types of care, such as trauma, or specific types of patients, such as children. Transport time may be longer, but patients will receive definitive care more quickly. No location of specialty centers and protocol for transport. Interfacility transport. Non-ambulatory patients or patients requiring medical monitoring may be between hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, home residents. AEMTs are responsible for health and well-being of patient during transport. Working with hospital staff, this is a must. Become familiar with hospital by observing equipment and how it is used function of staff members, policies and procedures in emergency areas. AEMTs may consult medical staff by radio. Best patient care occurs with rapport between all emergency care providers. Working with public safety agencies. Some public safety workers have EMS training become familiar with their role and responsibilities. They may be better prepared to perform certain functions. Best patient care is achieved through cooperation. Roles and responsibilities of the AEMT. That's something you can look, look at when you're studying. The professional attributes, that is something you can also review when you are studying, right? Integrity, empathy, you must be self-motivated, self-confident, must have good time management, need to be able to work in a team, and you need to be diplomatic, respectful, and you must deliver your care for the patient as best as possible. Every patient is entitled to compassion, respect, and the best care possible. Remember, you are a healthcare professional bound by patient confidentiality and HIPAA. And I think that would be the end of this chapter. <laughs>